Welcome to Discrete Math 2 or Combinatorics. This video series uses the textbook Kenneth H. Rosen's Discrete Mathematics and its Applications, the 8th edition. You'll note this is the same series I used for Discrete Math 1. We will be covering some of the same sections of the textbook, but in much more depth than we did in Discrete Math 1. So combinatorics is really all about enumeration or counting. And what I want to throw out there before we get too far into this is that it seems like it should be an easy thing learning how many ways something can happen, but that's really not the case. This is a 300 level class for a reason. The concepts themselves may seem very simple, but actually putting them together to solve a problem can be much more difficult. So yes, make sure you learn the formulas. Um, don't rely on them, rely on your own reasoning, rely on practice, 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 practice. Um, make sure that you are showing all of your calculations and explaining your work, because quite often I will have students who do things much differently than myself then that doesn't mean that they are wrong. It just means that it's not the way I went about it. So as long as you are providing me with your thought process, then we should be just fine. Before we just learn the rule of sum or exactly what it says the rule of sum is supposed to be, let's talk about how we can arrive at the rule of sum. So let's say I have two die, one is green and one is purple. How many ways are there to get a sum of seven or 11? Well, if I'm looking at a sum of seven, and this one throws a lot of people off, but a lot of people say, well, I can get a one and a six, or I can get a two and a five, or I can get a three and a four, which is very true, but a one on the green and a six on the purple is different than a six on the green and a one on the purple. So we're talking about not the number of combinations, but the number of permutations, which will make more sense when we learn about permutations and combinations. But for now, just stick with me. One and six is not the same outcome as six and one. Two and five and five and two are different outcomes. Three and four and four and three are different outcomes. Now for a sum of 11, again, five and six, six and five. So I had six total ways here. Let's get rid of that other stuff. I had six ways to get seven, and I had two ways to get 11. And so there are a total of eight ways that I could get either a sum of seven or a sum of 11. This brings us to the official rule of sum. The rule of sum says if a task can be done in either one of n1 ways or in one of n2 ways, where the two ways are disjoint, which means there's not a way in N1 that's also in N2, they are separate sets, then there are N1 plus N2 ways to complete the task. Now, a couple of key things here. Again, when you see that keyword or, that should tell you that we're using the rule of sum. You use the rule of sum when you have just one event that's occurring. So one event, but multiple ways it can happen. So for instance, during a local campaign, we have three Republican and two Democratic candidates that are nominated for president of the local school board. If the president is to be one of these candidates, how many possibilities are there? Well, if there are three Republican and two Democrat, and we know a person can't be both Republican and Democrat, all I have to do is take three plus two to get five. So there are five ways that that could happen, uh, five different possible presidents of the school board. In this course, you need to become very familiar and very comfortable with mathematical definitions. And so here's our first mathematical definition, the rule of sum in terms of sets. It says that the union of two sets, A union B, meaning we are adding the sets together, is A, the cardinality, so cardinality 
which just means the number of elements. So the number of elements in the union of two sets is simply the number of elements in the first set plus the number of elements in the second set. Again, as long as A and B are disjoint sets. So when we continue learning about the rule of sum for more complex problems, we will talk about what happens when those sets are not disjoint, but for now, we're just dealing with disjoint sets. So again, what we're looking at more generally, meaning, hey, guess what? We're not gonna have just two sets, we're going to maybe have quite a few, is the union of all of those sets is equal to the cardinality of each of the sets that we're adding together when all of those sets are disjoint. So again, this is saying the intersection of the sets is equal to the empty set, which means there are no elements shared in any of the sets. Let's look at a couple of practice of the rule of sum before we look at the rule of product. So a woman has decided to shop at one store today, either in the north part of town or the south part. If she visits the north part of town, she will shop at either a mall, a furniture store, or a jewelry store. So that's three outcomes. If she visits the south part of town, then she will shop at either a clothing store or a shoe store. That's two outcomes. How many possible shops are there? Well, none of these shops are the same, so 2 plus 3 equals 5. Easy peasy. Number 2. Oh, side note, in case you haven't watched any of the other series that I've put out here on YouTube, if you ever see one that says practice up here in blue, that blue is a really good indicator that you should pause and try your hand at those questions before I go through them with you. Um, because it's a really good, good idea to make sure you know what you're doing. And the fun thing is, then I go through the question and give you the solution so you can actually check your work. So let's look at the second one. A computer science instructor has two colleagues. One colleague has three textbooks on the analysis of algorithms, and the other has five. If n denotes the maximum number of different books in this topic that the instructor can borrow, give the possible value or values for n. So again, we're looking at the first colleague has three textbooks and the other has five textbooks. Now, unfortunately, this does not tell us that they don't have any textbooks in common. So if I said three plus five equals eight, so therefore n equals eight, I would be not quite correct. I have to keep in mind that it could be that the first colleague has three textbooks and those textbooks are all the same as the as three of the five of the other textbook or the other colleagues textbooks. So if that were the case, if these three are already included in this set, well then there are only five, five textbook options. So really I'm saying the minimum is five and the maximum is eight. So what are the values for n? Five through eight inclusive. Inclusive meaning the or equal to. So I feel good about the rule of sum. Let's take a look now at the rule of product or product rule, depending on which textbook you're looking at. Uh, during a local campaign, and now this one should look a little bit familiar to you because we have talked about this question already, but this is sort of a variation on the same question. So we have three Republican and two Democratic candidates nominated for president of the school board. How many possibilities exist for a pair of candidates, one from each party, to oppose each other for the eventual election? Now, of course, we're going to use the rule of product to determine the number of ways that this could happen, but let's take a look at a tree diagram to show the actual outcomes. So notice here I've given A, B, and C, and one, two, just to give them different labels. So where we would start is we would make a tree with three branches because there are three Republican candidates. So the first part of our tree would be the Republican candidates. So I could have A, or B, 
or C, be the Republican candidate. As for Democrat, it could be one or two. One or two. One or two. Now, why did I have to do one or two three times? Because there are three Republican candidates. Now, the beauty of a tree diagram is that I can then follow the branches. So this is A to one. So this outcome is A versus one. And then A to two. So this outcome is A versus two. And you get the idea. This would be B1, B2, C1, C2. Now, do I love tree diagrams? No, I sure don't because it just takes a while to make them and it's kind of silly. So unless they say, what are all of the outcomes and you're trying to give yourself a graphical organizer to help you uh, to visualize what's going on, I don't recommend the tree diagram. However, we are going to talk about the rule of product, which will give us the number. And the number, as we can see, is that there are six different ways that two of these candidates can oppose each other. So let's look at it the Matthew way now. The rule of product says if a procedure can be broken down into a sequence of two tasks, and there are n1 ways to do the first task and n2 ways to do the second task, then tasks n1 and n2 can be done in n1 times n2 ways. Now, before we do the math here, I want to point out to you that this is not one event. This is two events or more occurring. So when we use the rule of sum, it was one event occurring, but multiple ways to arrive at that outcome. This is two or more events occurring. And of course, then we're going to be multiplying those ways. So Again, how would we do this local campaign problem? Well, there are three Republican and two Democratic candidates. So there are six total outcomes. Again, what are they? If they don't ask, then we don't care. We just multiply to find the solution. So there are six possibilities for a pair of candidates to oppose one another. We're going to finish up with a practice question, but before we do that, let's take a look quickly at the product rule in terms of sets, just as we did for the rule of sum. So if we have A1, A2, all the way through AM, which are finite sets, the number of elements of the Cartesian product of these sets, so pause for a moment to make sure we know what a Cartesian product is. If we're talking about the Cartesian product, we're talking about that our outcome will look, say, like an ordered pair if I'm only dealing with two sets of values or an ordered triple. So basically, it's something from A1 and something from A2, or something from A1 and something from A2 and something from A3, all the way through however many sets that you have. So again, the task of choosing an element in the Cartesian product is done by choosing an element from the first set, an element from the second, the third, all the way through the nth set. So by the product rule, the Cartesian product of M sets is taking a one, the number of elements, again, this is the cardinality, so the number of elements in A1 times the number of elements in A2, all the way through the number of elements in AM. Let's finish up with a practice question over the rule of product. And again, I encourage you to press pause and try the three questions on your own first. That last one has a little bit of a tricky business on it, uh, but I think that you can do it. So press pause, try them all. And when you're ready, let's get started together. Again, we're going to be dealing with the same question through all three parts of this. And all of them have to do with a student ID made up of three uppercase letters followed by two digits. So what we're dealing with is three uppercase letters, which is 26 options. Again, they specified uppercase. If they didn't, there would be 26 uppercase, 26 lowercase, and then followed by two digits. And digits are the values zero through nine, and there are 10 of them. So how many possible IDs exist? You might be like, hey, this is super easy. It's 26 to the third times 10 squared, and that's correct. But if you need to, 
then please just write it out like this and say, well, the first option, there's 26 different letters I can use. And for the second place, there are 26 letters. And the third place, there are 26 letters. And then there are 10 digits and 10 digits. So that's my solution. Now, this solution is perfectly acceptable. Um, if the the uh, product of all of those values is one that's easy to find, I encourage you to go ahead and provide me with both solutions. So this is 1,757,600, also known as 26 to the third times 10 squared. For the second, how many IDs are possible if duplicate letters or numbers aren't allowed? So again, feel free to write these out. It does help you stay organized. The first is a letter and that's 26 options. The second is a letter, but now there are only 25 options, 25 because I used a letter here that I cannot reuse on my second position. And following that same thought process, there would be 24 options for the third letter because I can't reuse the first or second letters that I used. The first number, there are 10 ways. But the second number, there are only nine different options because I can't reuse whatever happened um, on the fourth position. So again, what do I end up with? 1,404,000. Again, I've provided both the way that I found the solution and the solution. So please don't just provide me with this answer uh, or I'll assume that you, you know, found some answer key somewhere. The last one, how many student IDs are possible with an even number of A's? This is the one that's a little bit tricky. Um, and again, finding the even number of A's is pretty easy. I could have zero, oops, not zeros, zero A's, or I could have two A's. I can't have four A's because I only have three uppercase letters. So that's pretty straightforward. Now, what uh, students often do is they'll say, okay, if I have zero A's, then I can have 25 options, which is, this is zero A's, 25 options, which is every letter except for A, times 25 options, times 25 options, and then times 10 times 10, because we're back to no restrictions. We don't repeat the restrictions from two. And that value is 1,562,500. And then I get a lot of students who say there are two A's, and therefore, there is an A, so just one option, and an A, so just one option, and a not A, so 25 options, and then times 10 times 10. And while that's great and correct, that's not the only correct way I can have two A's, because I could have an A here, a not A here, and an A here, or I could have a not A here times an A times an A and then times my two digits. Each of these are 2,500 and there are three ways to do that. So one, two, three different ways. So my total is 1,562,500 plus 7,500 or you can even write out three times 2,500. And so my total solution, 1,570,000. Let me get rid of that because I'm out of room. So again, not super, super tricky, but it, it just makes you think a little bit more than just the straightforward one times one times 25 times 10 times 10. For right now, we don't have a way to tackle the fact that there are three different ways that that can happen, but we will as we move through this course. Coming up next, we're going to take a look at the complement rule, which is also known as the opposite problem. And we're just going to do some practice with some more complex counting problems, which just means we're going to be putting together the rule of sum and the rule of product and the complement rule to just do some practice.